book of Isaiah tonight, Isaiah chapter number 41, Isaiah 41, and as I mentioned a moment ago, I do have a lot to get through uh, tonight, uh, but I can see through the windows all the way through the foyer outside, and it is raining very, very hard, and so as long as it rains, I've got plenty of time, right? And so uh, uh, we'll get into the uh, outline tonight, but we'll be in uh, Isaiah chapter number 41, and uh, as I've begun doing on, on Wednesday night, <clears throat> just to keep track of time, I'm going I'm to give you the title uh, of what I'm teaching on tonight, then we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer, uh, and then we'll read our text, and I am going to read several verses tonight from Isaiah uh, chapter number 41, and uh, I will, I do have 12 points in my outline, and I will move quickly tonight, and uh, those of you that uh, do take notes, uh, get ready, because I will move through it, uh, but if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, I want you to, and I'm going to point out some things to you tonight that you may want to underline uh, in the Word of God, but tonight I'm going to teach on what God will do for you, what God will do for you. Don't you love to hear stories about what God does for somebody else? Nobody, just me. Sure you do. Wouldn't it better what God will do for you? Uh, I love re reading of the, the greatness of God on the pages of Scripture. But God is no respecter of persons. And what God has done in the past, He'll do for you. Uh, we, 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 we say it, and it's true. We ought to say it uh, all the time. Uh, Christ died for all men. Everybody in this room, Christ died for every single one of us. Uh, it doesn't matter what our standing, doesn't matter what our background, Christ died for all of us. So now that we're His children, He will continue to work for all of us. And there's some wonderful things uh, in this chapter. And I, I've enjoyed so much my own personal Bible study being in the book of Isaiah. Uh, but I want to teach on that tonight, what God will do for you. Father, I pray that you'll help us tonight. May the Spirit of God be our teacher, our instructor. Uh, may we listen intently to what the Scripture has for us. And Father, may we be reminded of what a great God you are, what a good God you are, uh, how you care for us. I'm reminded as, I, uh, as my mind goes to the study tonight that uh, when you think, you think on us and the fact that an almighty God would think about us, uh, that you uh, see every tear that we shed, you uh, know every situation that we're in. And Father, I pray that we'll be reminded uh, tonight of some promises and some truths. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 41, we'll begin reading in verse number 10. And we're going to read down all the way through uh, verse number 20. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you to follow along with me <clears throat> as I read beginning in verse number 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. <clears throat> Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they sh that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shalt not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee, shall be as nothing, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee. Saith the Lord and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry lands springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittai tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. What wonderful, wonderful verses of Scripture. And God is reminding His people in the midst of their bondage that He is always in control. They are never alone. A few statements I want to make very, very quickly by way of introduction and get into the outline just to remind us, and they may seem, they're simple, 
They may seem uh, uh, so simple that we just pass them over, but they're so, uh, so, so true, and we need them in our life. And the first statement I'll make to you is, God loves you. Amen. Think about that. We say this, we see bumper stickers, we say it in passing, well, God loves you, sometimes sarcastically, but think about it, God loves you. He cares about you. And every one of us, every one of us uh, has uh, things that we have to deal with in life, uh, things that we're going to deal with in the future. We have, we have difficulties, we have ups, we have downs, we have valleys, we have mountains. And it's good for us to know that God cares about us. He loves us. He doesn't leave us. Oftentimes, we face things in life where we wonder, uh, does anybody care? Uh, and, and yes, people care, uh, but God cares, and He'll never leave us. Uh, when God, we see a lot of thing, uh, promises in this passage of Scripture, and when God makes a promise, it is as good as done. In the mind of God, how many of you are saved tonight? Let me see your hand. In the mind of God, positionally, you are already in heaven with Him. Because when he makes a promise, it's done. We don't have to, we, we're just waiting for it to be fulfilled. It's as good as done. So all the promises in Scripture, if God makes a promise, it is done. Sometimes we wonder if it's going to happen. Sometimes we don't see how perhaps it's going to happen. And sometimes we don't even realize that it has happened. But when God makes a promise, it is as good as done. The next statement by way of introduction, God works in us through His Word. How do we know what God has promised? The Word of God. God has recorded all the promises for us. This morning, it, it, I took some time and I read uh, through the entire book of, of Joshua and is reminding the promises and promises and promises that God promised Moses. And he reminds the people, I promised Moses, now I can fulfill that, but you've got to act on it. God says something is going to happen. And he works in us through his word because we know uh, the promises of God. But this book is a supernatural book. When we conform to the word of God, it changes us. The Holy Spirit of God that dwells within us as a Christian is the same Holy Spirit of God that authored the book, and they bear witness one with the other. Uh, if you're feeling discouraged, I, don't raise your hand, but how many of you felt discouraged? You just open up the word of God and begin to read through the scripture. It makes you feel better. Uh, it makes you feel cleaner. It works through you. You know where you get your confidence in serving the Lord? It's from the Word of God. A Christian absent from the Bible is a weak Christian. A Christian absent from the Word of God is a Christian that has weak faith. A Christian that is absent, has the Word of God absent from their life, there is no boldness. There is no security. Why? Because God uses the, wor the Word of God to work through us. That's why God is never going to give a command that's outside Scripture. Uh, it doesn't matter what voice you hear or, or, or how convincing that voice was to you. If it contradicts the Word of God, it wasn't the voice of God. God speaks through the Word of God. And the Word of God works in us. Uh, he works in us through His Word. Uh, we need to, in our Christian life, daily learn to, to, to be more dependent by faith on God. Leave things in God's hand. Uh, sometimes God takes things out of our hand. As some of you tonight, you're dealing with, and some of you, I have uh, had several in recent days. Uh, let me know of some upcoming tests. Let me know of some health things that you're dealing with and want me to pray about that. And I've been praying through those. Uh, well, there's, there's nothing you can do physically about your own health. It's in God's hands. And so uh, there's, does fear come with that? Certainly it does. But you know, how, you know where we get our confidence? From the Word of God. Uh, he's, not, he's not given us the spirit of fear through His Word. So it works through us. So tonight, I want us to be reminded, and this is where I've got to move quickly, of what God will do for us. Uh, just in this, this short passage, just in these few verses of Scripture, we're going to see something. And I want you and I to grow in our confidence in God. I believe God. I hope you believe God. I can stand here tonight and say I'm saved not because of me, because I believe God. I believe God is going to provide for me and my family. I believe there's things that I should do. I should. Uh, God's not going to provide for you if you don't put forth the effort. But if you're doing everything you know how God, why? Because I believe God. 
I believe God will, will bless faithfulness. Why? Because I believe God. We need to be reminded that we can believe God. And tonight, in these 12 things I'm going to give you, you may be dealing with all of them right now. I don't know. You may be dealing with some of them right now. You may deal with some of them in the future. But here's a good list for you and I to be reminded. I would, I would say this. At some point in our Christian life, we're going to touch all of them. And we're going to need to be reminded of what God will do for us. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse number 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful reminder. Uh, for I am with thee. Notice... He says, for I am thy God. Notice the next two words, I will. We're going to focus on those two words tonight, I will. I will is, uh, he says, I will, uh, several times in verse number 10. He says again in in verse number 13. He says it again in verse number 14, verse 15, verse 17, verse 18, and verse 19. Remember what we've already said? A, A promise that God makes is as good as done. And as we all face different things in our life, we need to be reminded that when I can't, God says, I will. When we we don't even know what we need. You ever prayed that prayer? God, I don't even know what to ask you. But God is such a good God, God will take care of us. So let's look at verse uh, number 10. For I am thy God, I will strengthen thee. Uh, The first thing I want to mention to you tonight, uh, remind what God will do for you, is he says, I will strengthen thee. In weakness. I taught on this a few weeks ago. The one characteristic needed to be used by God in its weakness. Now, I'll not reteach that tonight, but that's just a reminder to us that we all find ourselves in weakness. We all have weakness. But sometimes we say, well, I cannot be where I need to be, become what I need to become, or do what I need to do because of my weakness. No, that's not true. When your weakness is, God will sustain you. And He says, I will strengthen thee. Uh, Let's get this straight right right now, Christian. Some things you need to let go. We say it all piously, just let go and let God. But living, that's a different story. And God said, I will strengthen thee. He will strengthen in weakness. If you've got a weakness tonight, if you're lacking tonight, God will strengthen you. That is a promise of what God will do for you. He says, I will strengthen in weakness. Number two, see how fast we're moving? It stopped raining, the pressure's back on. Uh, In verse number 10, yea, I will help thee. Uh, The promise we have, number two, is I will equip you. Uh, You may, God may have a task for you to do, and you feel inadequate in doing it. Uh, The best analogy of this is when that mom's going to have that first child before that baby is born, I can do this. After that baby is born, I feel very inadequate in doing this. He say, well, that's just not me. Oh, you just wait. You just wait. But but, but seriously tonight, uh, we all have things. Boy, and we can use that as an analogy. I have have three children, a couple of them still at home, and and, boy, I need the help of God. Uh, and, and as a Christian, the things that we have to do as a Christian, say, well, maybe God's speaking to you about taking that next step in your Christian life. There's an area of service, and I just don't think I can do it. He says, I will help thee. He will equip us. Say, well, And sometimes our young people struggle with this. They feel that God wants them to do something. And I'm certain there's some of them in here tonight that, that this applies to them. Say, well, when I, get, when I get everything I need to be able to do that, then I'll fully surrender to do that. That's not how God works. <clears throat> he, he created you to do something. If He calls you to do it, it's not a bad sign that you feel so inadequate. It's a good sign that you feel so inadequate. Because He will equip you to do what you need to do for him. How is he going to do it? Is he going to send you down to the local bookstore to go get everything you need? No, he's going to equip you with the Word of God. He's going to equip you with the promises and truth. So he says, I will equip you. So tonight, if you don't feel like you have what it takes to serve him, he says, I'll equip you. I'll help you do it. I'll I'll help you uh, serve. All right? He says, yea, I will help thee. Yea, see those two words again, I will 
uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, before I give you number three, let me just remind you, he didn't say, I might. He says, I will. He didn't say, I'm going to think about it. He says, I will. And when God makes a promise, it is as good as done. But we see at the end of verse number 10, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The third thing God will do for you is, He says, I will uphold thee by my power. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Well, when you are walking with God, serving God, uh, living life uh, with His help, it's one thing to walk in and have the security of Him with you. By my right hand of righteousness, I will hold you. Uh, remember when you were little, or remember when you had little children, or maybe you have them now, and they hold your hand when they first start walking, and, bef- and, and they stumble, and you're steadying them? You all know what I'm talking about? Some of you look like that. Never, you, you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So they stumble, and you have their hand. What, what is he doing? He's sus- you're sustaining them. Uh, by your power. And before long, before long you realize, that this is usually the impatient dad, it's like, well, I'm just going to pick you up and carry you like this by the arm and hope your arm doesn't come out of socket and we'll get to where we need to go. But isn't that a lot like our Christian life is? We stumble and he says, I will uphold thee by his power. It is through uh, his right hand of righteousness. We have a big God, don't we? We have a great God, don't we? It'd be one thing if it was a God that we could never feel His presence, that we could never depend on, but this is a God that in fellowship, He will uphold us by His own hand, the might of His hand. It says, I will uphold thee, and then uh, I will, uh, verse number uh, 13, let's go to number 4. He said, fear or for, the, for I, the Lord thy God, here's the same terminology again, will hold thy right hand. I will assure you by my fellowship. Aren't you glad that we have, as we saw in verse number 10, he says, I will uphold thee. We have a, a God that is stronger than we are. We have a God that can uphold us. You ever felt weak, not just physically, but spiritually? God sustains us. God, God upholds us. But then we see in verse number 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. He says, I, I will assure you by my fellowship. We have a God who wants to fellowship with us. Sometimes, you know, we have different people in our life that all bring security to us. And with a child, if I can just see mom and dad, if I just know they're there, we have security uh, with, with different people. But there's nothing like knowing that we're fellowshipping. We're just, that, that's why, Christian, fellowship with God. If you don't have a fellowship with God, you need to get one. Now, uh, we, we have a relationship through our salvation. We have a fellowship that should be on a daily basis through the Word of God and through prayer. Fellowship with Him. Uh, I I walk through the garden alone. I walk with Him. I talk with Him. Fellowship with God. Uh, When everything else you 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 can't control around you, knowing that God is present, uh, that gives great security. It's fellowship. Everything's okay. You know, I, I talked to God today. I got reassured from the Word of God. You, let's just be honest tonight. You feel better when you're closer to God. Uh, it, it, any Christian that's away from God, out of fellowship with God tonight, they don't feel secure. It, no matter all the bravado in the world, it doesn't matter. Knowing that if you need Him, He's there... How do you know that? It's through fellowship. Uh, God forbid you got a terrible phone call tonight. 
would you have to, and I'll say it like this, find God to get a hold of Him? Or could you just pick up the last conversation you had with Him earlier in the day? Could you just say, oh, it's me again? There's a security. He said, I will assure you by my fellowship. Think about it. God wants to fellowship with you. God wants to fellowship with each one of us. If God would save me and he never wanted to talk to me again, I'd take salvation. That's not why God, God saved us so that we could have a relationship with him. He, he will assure us by his fellowship. Uh, verse number 13 same verse, for I, the Lord, thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee. I like this one, number five. Saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. Now, we've seen that several times already, that phrase, I will help thee. We see it again in verse number 13. Uh, but number five, the thing that God will do for you, he says, I will preserve you when fearful. Uh, notice, notice how this is worded, saying unto thee, uh, fear not, I will help thee. He'll preserve you when fearful. It says fear not. Every one of us, every one of us has fears in our life. Everyone, I remind you, and I, I remind us all the time, I remind myself, I remind in counsel, in interactions with, 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 with all of you, this, God does not give a spirit of fear. So if you're afraid about something in your life, that doesn't come from God. But let's be honest, we have fears. And the fears vary from person to person, a situation to situation. But what has God promised us? He says, uh, saying, fear not, I will help thee. In that fear, he's saying, don't fear, I'll preserve you when you are fearful. Uh, when you're fearful, God's going to be there. He'll preserve you. He never lets us down. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He says, fear not. Uh, why should we not have fear? He says, I'll help thee. Sometimes fears come because we, we can't fix it. And that's frustrating. And some personalities are different than others, and some of the most frustrating thing that could, that could happen to you in your life is you not have the answer for it. You not be able to change it. You not be able to control it. And then the fear comes, what am I going to do? He says, fear not, for I will help thee. God never promises us that we will not enter into a valley. He never promises us that there'll never be times that fears can come. He says, fear not. And why does he say fear not? Because I'll help thee. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be the one to sustain you. Number six, we've got to hasten because I've got several more to get to. Uh, look at verse number 14. He says it again, fear not, thou worm Jacob, and be men of Israel. Same phrase, I will help thee. But let's look at the phrase in verse 14, I will help thee in context of the verse. He says, fear not, thou worm Jacob. Interesting uh, application to Jacob, speaking of God's people. Uh, that, I, the worm is referencing somebody who's afflicted, somebody who's helpless. Jacob, or the people of Israel, they were uh, in Babylon, they're in the captivity. Thou worm, you're afflicted, you're helpless. You're, you're in a situation where, uh, it, isn't that the way we are sometimes? You know, everything's going good, our shoulders are back, we're walking straight. Uh, but then when the trials come, we feel like that worm. He's saying, thou worm, man looks at you differently. Uh, you're afflicted, you're helpless, you're in captivity. He says, fear not. Thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee. Number six, I will sustain you in trial. Every one of us has trials in our life. It, it, I, I, wrote, I wrote about this to some degree in my book, Satan's Toolbox, and I applied it to churches, but it's certainly true of every Christian. You're either coming out of a trial or going into one. That's life. Uh, you say, well, whoo, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of that one. Well, catch your breath. 
Because if you live much longer, there's going to be another one. I say, why is that? It, that that's the life. The Bible tells us. Christ reminds us that, but the, the Scripture speaks to it. The book of Ecclesiastes reminds us of that. Some things, are just, that's just life. But when we go through those trials, he says, I will sustain thee. But he's given the connotation of thou worm, Jacob. You're afflicted. Uh, you're, you're, in, you're in distress. You're in a tri- trial. You're helpless. He says, I will help thee. Well, isn't that an encouragement that when you go through a trial, he says, I will help you? If, if I'm in a trial, the person I want help in me is the Almighty, is God. And young people, listen to me and heed this warning. He can do a lot more for you than the friends who will turn you against him. He'll sustain you in your trial. What a wonderful promise. He says, I will help thee. Remember what we said by way of introduction? God makes a promise. It's already done. It's as good as done. He says, I will help thee. Number seven. It is found in verse number 15. He says, Behold, I will make thee. There's those two words again. I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Now, I don't know if this means more to you if you get to a certain age or not. I don't know. But he says, A new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shalt make the hills as chaff. Number seven, he says, I will make you valuable in service. I want some of you, to, if you get nothing else tonight, I want you to get this. Because you've, you've got a little more age on you. Or your health has changed. Or your opportunity has changed. Or, or life circumstances changed. Has changed. And we lament and we and we get upset because we can't do for God what we used to do for God. We say, Oh, I serve at his pleasure. We say, Oh, whatever God wants to do for me, but I but now I'm at this place in my life and I can't do what I used to be able to do. And God says, Behold, I will make thee a new. Sharp, threshing, instrument, having teeth. How many of you are saved tonight? Let me see your hand again. Okay? Pay close attention. How many of you are alive and breathing tonight? That has nothing to do with the message there's a couple of you I was worried about. So uh, now we know that everybody is alive, meaning God still has you here. You got to understand the, the heart of God. Once you receive Christ as your Savior, He longs. To have his children with him. That's why the scripture says, uh, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. While we're weeping down here, heaven is rejoicing because now you are with your Father. If he has you here, it's because he has you here for a purpose. And if you can't do for God what you could once do for God, that does not mean God is done with you. Everybody listen to me very, very carefully. You may have something way, way, way back, something you did before. Or you were saved, you say, well, that eliminates me. God says, I'll make you new. Isn't it wonderful that even when the prodigal comes back, the prodigal might not could have done what they did before, but God says, behold, I will make thee a new, sharp instrument. Some of you don't have the energy to go knock on doors like you used to knock on doors. That doesn't mean God's done with you. He'll make you a new instrument. Now, you need to be content with the new instrument he makes you, but he's not done with you. He'll still use you. He says, I will make you valuable in service. And by the way, another man doesn't des- decide whether you're valuable or not. God does. The only one who really knows how valuable you are in service to him is the one you're serving. We can look around and say, well, I, that, that's not very... But there's a God in heaven. If He's given you something to do for Him, He's leaving you on this earth for that. It's valuable to Him. And don't we say, well, that's why I just want to serve Him. I just want to make Him happy. Well, sometimes God changes what we thought He had planned. I, 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 know, I, I praise God 
And, and, and you know, there's several retired pastors and retired uh, preachers that are, that are in our church. I praise the Lord for that. But there's also some who went to Bible college thinking God was going to have them do something else. But now you're, you're a layman in the Emmanuel Baptist Church. God, don't say, well, I, I just, that's what I thought. Well, now I don't. No, no, no. God is making you into, a, it made you into something. He has something different planned for you. And if that's what God's will is for you, it's not a step down. Uh, because God knows what's going to take place in our life. And he says, I will make you valuable in service. When we all get to heaven one day, we're just going to be so thankful and excited that we, had, we got to do some part serving God. Down here, we may compare this and that, and the Bible warns us against that. When we get to heaven, all that's going to matter is I did what I could do for my Savior. That's what's going to matter. And if God takes you and, and, and makes you do something new for Him, makes you into a new instrument, you still have value. And I'm afraid, I, I, would, I would just dare say, and I could make an, I'm making an assumption here, that there are some who could be doing more for God, but you refuse to accept your role as the new instrument. And you're still thinking about the glory days. You're still thinking about the dreams that you used to have. You're still thinking about the opportunity. Well, I can't do what I used to do. Well, No. If, if you can't go, you can pray for those going. He says, I will make thee. He will make you valuable in service. Behold. Look at verse 15. Behold. What's the next two words? I will. Is that a promise of God? That is a promise of God. He says he'll do it. That's a good one. We could just end on that, but I'm not going to. In verse 15, Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. He'll make us valuable in service. Look at me at verse number 17. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. Here's another, I will. He says, in, in number eight, he says, I will encourage you in prayer. When the poor and needy seek water, and there's none. And their tongue faileth for thirst. He says, I'll hear them. Isn't that a wonderful promise that God will hear us when we pray? So, sometimes we, we pray, we wonder if anybody hears us. He hears the Bible tells us he hears our groanings. I will hear. What's what we ought to have confidence when we pray? Because he'll hear us. It's, it's not a matter of you having the need. It's a matter that you have a God who will hear you that can provide that need. We are so self-sufficient in our own minds that we don't, don't, don't miss this. That we don't consider what God has as ours. I have to do it on my own. And do we not have a benevolent God that if we have a need, He's waiting to give it to us? But if we don't get it on our own, uh, then somehow that, that, that's a failure. No, God puts us in situations where we have to ask Him. It would give us a whole lot more confidence tonight, would it not? If we considered everything God's got, I can have access to. Why do I have to have it? In my possession, tucked away in the cupboard somewhere. You know why? Because we get our security in what's in the cupboard and not our security in the God. That All we have to do is say, God, I need this. If I'm thirsty when the poor and needy seek water and there is none, why well, have nothing? Well, God says, I'll hear you. I will hear them. Number nine, almost there. Verse 18, I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. Uh, number nine, he says, I will supply in the time of need. I will open rivers in high places uh, where there is no water, there is no provision. He said, that's when I'll supply. He'll put a, 
God can put a river where there's not one. And it's like the children of Israel when they went out through the desert. Oh, where are we going to drink from? He, he can just drop a, just go to that rock and he'll give you water out of the rock. Well, I'm not going there. I don't see it. God can put a river where there's not one. Let me, let me make this statement. I'll jump in number 10. It's not about what you don't have, but about what God does have. And if we as Christians, we think this way, Pastor, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, God, I don't have. I don't. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what God has. And I think it would thrill the heart of God if his children thought this way. Not, I can't go out in that desert, there's nothing. No, I can go in that, instead of thinking it that way, I can go in that desert because God can drop a river anywhere He wants to drop a river. He says, I will supply in your time of need. Again, God never tells His children that we won't have times of need. Never tells us that. He just tells us over and over again that He will supply in our time of need. Uh, verse 18 as well. He says, I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will, see the two words again, I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. He says, I will transform thee. Think about it. He'll make the wilderness a pool of water. That's quite a transformation. Uh, he'll make the dry land springs of water. Quite a transformation. God is a transforming God. A transforming God. He can transform a life. He can transform a marriage. He can transform a home. He, 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 can, he, can, he can transform a... He can, he can do whatever He wants to do. It's by the power of God, by the Word of God. You think about it. Uh, we're saved out of a life of sin... And here we sit on a Wednesday night, last week of August, rainy weather, threatens of storms and hurricanes and who knows what else. What has happened? The Word of God has transformed us. Uh, I don't ever worry about the crowd on Wednesday night, never. We always have a full house. Is it because of the, the outstanding Bible teaching? Well, of course it is. No, no. It, it's, it's because... God has done a work inside of us. As a church. Some of you, if, 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 if somebody had told you that you'd be attending church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and when there's a special meeting, you're there all the time, they say, you're crazy. But something's transformed you. Let me remind you, if there's somebody you know that he's transforming, uh, God can do it. Your circumstances, God can transform them. I don't know, Pastor. It's looking pretty, it's pretty tough. I've been dealing with this for a while. Well, if he can make a wilderness, a pool of water, uh, he can probably transform your life, transform your circumstances. Number 11, we find in verse 19, first two words of verse 19, I will, I will plant in the wilderness the cedar. The cedar tree is a tree of shade. There's got to be water. He goes on to list, if you can imagine, where there was nothing in the desert, in the wilderness, now there are groves of trees. And number 11, I'll give you like this. He says, I will comfort thee. Uh, say, Pastor, what, I, I, I'm failing to see the correlation well, those trees now provide shade, comfort in the desert. Probably to the same degree that the, as you got to think, he's speaking to his people who are in bondage, as he used to have that pillar of cloud in the wilderness to give them shade during the day. I'm in the desert, the sun is hot circumstances, God can put a grove. What he's saying is, I'll comfort you. Go rest. I'll comfort you. Nobody can comfort how God can comfort you. And sometimes we always consider that in moments that we grieve, and that certainly applies. But there's more to just those times of grieving and brokenheartedness where we get the comfort of God. The greatest comfort, yes, that's great comfort during those times, but a great comfort is just 
in our daily living, as if God just pats you on the shoulder and says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'm providing you some shade. Just rest for a minute. I'll provide you comfort. There's a desert, and then there's a shade tree to sit and say, well, that doesn't seem very comforting to me. Be caught out in the desert. You'd be wanting a shade tree. Well, we live in Florida. We understand what that's like. He says, I will comfort thee. And then number 12, we look in verse number 19, I will plant in the wilderness. Then look halfway down. He says, I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together. We go into verse number 20, that they may see and know and consider and understand together. God always, we'll finish reading that verse in just a moment, but we need to be reminded, God, nothing with God is haphazard. Everything has a purpose and a reason. We may not know what it is. We may not understand it. But God is not taken surprised by anything. He said, "This is all these things I will do, I will do, I will do, I will do. Verse 20, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Number 12, I will show all the hand of the Lord. So what you and I have to be reminded of. One, we are not deity. We, 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 we are flesh. We have a limited amount of strength and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and ability. I can say it like this, our tank gets empty, spiritually speaking. Circumstances come that we have no control. And God allows things like that to take place. But then we have these promises that we've seen tonight. He says, I will do it, I will do it, I will do it, I will do it, I will do it. Remember, a promise that God makes is as good as done. And he does it so that we have the benefit. But on top of that, he says, I'm going to do it so everybody sees. So that everybody knows and considers God did this. God sustained. God strengthened. God comforted. We really, as Christians, generally speaking, we really have issues with God getting glory. Because we fail to be, remind ourselves that everything we deal with in our life, we ought to be living so that God does get the glory. And he says, I'll, he says, I'll put a river in the desert. So the only thing that can be said is, God did that. They'll see it, they'll consider it. And after they consider for some time, all they can say is, well, God did it. It's by the hand of God. How many tonight would stand and testify that the only way, you look back in your life, the only way I made it through certain, circum, certain circumstances is because God. God. Well, you're not the only one who's probably seen that in your life. He says, I will. And I, thank, I am thankful for the promises of God. All of us have been in circumstances. But how am I going to get through this? What's going to be the end result? We don't always have to be hanging our head in those times. Because we have a God who makes some promises. Does God not care about His, his church? Sure He does. God, God will take care of His church. He says, I will, I will, I will. So many times I think Christians... And you hear this a lot from, 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 you hear this many times for those that grow up in church. Well, I was doing everything I knew to do and God allowed, or I did. What does that have to do with anything? God wants to show himself mighty. I will. I will. And he's not going to give you more comfort than you need today. It's the, it's the same principle that with the children of Israel, he, he, he provided that manna. He gave them enough for the day. Why? Because tomorrow they would have to get up and they would have to look to God and get what they needed for the day. 
somewhere, I've, I read something about that. I think it was in the New Testament. Give us this day our monthly budget, <laughs> our daily bread, our daily bread. Physically speaking, but how about spiritually speaking as well? What you need today? We have a big God. We have a great God. You may not need this today, but I can tell you it encourages me. There's times I have to go to the Word of God, and I just have to let God remind me. You don't even have to know what's going on. Just know that I'm God, and I've got it taken care of. And I'm just like you. I'm human. I have my failures, and I have all those things. And sometimes I want to say, but God, let me help you out here. Let me let you, give you some information you may not have. No, God's got all the information. He will. I want us to be a people who have great confidence in God. A great confidence in God. A great confidence in God. I believe God. Why? Because He will. He will. He will. Sometime in the future, we're all going to face another trial, another valley. That's just the way life is. Maybe the first words that come to our mind will be those two words, I will. I will. You can count on God. You can depend on God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your...